started even though uh, the previous homes are attractive, of course. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Sasha Dimitriev from the uh, University of Gothenburg. Uh, Sasha, he uh, did his undergraduate studies in, uh, in Rostock, and then he did his PhD at EPFL, and was also at uh, the Max Planck in, in Stuttgart. And then he, he moved to Chalmers in Gothenburg, where he was a uh, young faculty. Uh, later he, he joined uh, also the, the University of Gothenburg, where he's now a full professor. And during those, uh, the recent years, he was also on a long sabbatical in, in the group of uh, Mark Bronkes, uh, Bronkes at Stanford University. Uh, so I don't know how to describe your field, but... Uh, but, but uh, <coughs> Sasha comes with a background in, in condensed matter physics and uh, experimental uh, studies of, of, of surfaces, STM work, etc. Now he's doing plasmonics. Uh, if I should just say very quickly, we, we of course learned from our optics books that, that magnetism is never playing a role at optical frequencies. I think you will today at least see some, uh, some attempts of, of magneto optics effects uh, being enhanced if you go to nanoscale structures and we are looking very much forward to that session. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Asger, for inviting me here in the first place. And thank you all of you to show up here uh, for, for this talk. And uh, I was warned that not necessarily everyone has the background in sort of nano-optics and so I'll try to, to take it easy and whenever it will be a little bit heavier, uh, I'll try to stay on those slides a little bit longer and try to sort of explain that in a more simple and relaxed way. So don't be scared of whatever is coming. So as Asger mentioned, we try to do something with light, and, and that is happening at the nanoscale. And also we try to bring in the, the magnetism. And of course, like Asger also mentioned, the fundamentally magnetism and light are not really keen on interacting. Light is extremely high frequency, and magnetism is at best four orders of magnitude slower. So how do you bring that all together? First, I would... Uh, like to acknowledge the people who are contributing over the past uh, 10 years, 15 years to these uh, projects and some are have already left my group in different places in the world now uh, uh, we have also keep on going collaborating with the Chalmers University of Technology which is also in Gothenburg and also our long-term collaborators in Nanogun in San Sebastian uh, recently in Linköping University, it's a Swedish university, and uh, in Belgium, in IMEC, and the Ecole Polytechnique in France. And there will be different aspects of uh, the science of light at the nanoscale that I'll feature. And actually these different collaborations bring different flavors into these aspects, like magnetism, sometimes solar actually, so we uh, do a fair deal of uh, uh, working with, with solar light and trying to also couple it to nanostructures and see well where magnetism would come there eventually, maybe that will be at the end. But first uh, let's think about the grand challenge and as we formulated recently, the grand challenge might be that we want the re reconfigurable optics. And you of course know the human eye is able to refocus and whatever you look at you can do that in milliseconds to refocus and actively change your lens to adapt to the environment. Unfortunately, the, uh, the standard optical equipment cannot do that because you have fixed lenses, you have fixed polarizers, you have all these components that once they're manufactured, they are fixed in their function and to add extra functions, you either need to replace these components or start fiddling with your optical setup and combine them in different ways. So what nature is doing uh, sort of seamlessly and every one of you is doing every single second in optics is still not very accessible. 
So the idea would be why not to have some sort of surfaces uh, and of course they will be covered with some sort of uh, small structures that would interact with light. It so happens that the wavelength of let's say visible light is 600 nanometers so you would imagine this kind of structures that interact with light maybe at that scale maybe smaller so in some nanoscale range and if you would imagine the functionality that could be changed in real time let's say you can change the polarization, you can change the phase, you can change the intensity <coughs> or the propagation direction that would be really interesting so whatever you send in could still be reconfigured and the function of your element could be changed in time either fast or sort of in a static way but if you would ask me why would that be important technologically but of course we know that even the recent examples of this um, mobile technology and the cameras that enter you actually have to use two cameras to focus on the landscape uh, sort of the, the panoramic uh, um, picture and the portrait just requires different type of lensing and of course if you would think that instead of two we are just using one camera and the lens that would be sitting in front of that camera would be adaptable and changeable in real time that would of course save in uh, space, save in weight, save in whatever uh, enters into the price of that phone even though design of that phone probably <laughs> enters majorly in the price but still uh, technologically even at this current stage we would actually want to have some even simple lenses that are tunable and are still uh, that could be integrated into the entire circuitry of that phone then of course we are staying in, uh, in that paradigm of uh, Cupertino and uh, Silicon Valley so what about the, the smart uh, augmented reality devices uh, again, you would like uh, projection uh, optics working dynamically. I mean, what augmented reality does is just uh, sort of what the smart glasses add to your vision is sort of the extra features of extra information that you could uh, dynamically uh, project uh, on your vision uh, screen that is basically positioned right next to your eyes. And again, these things are static, or uh, it's a little bit of a cumbersome uh, mechanics that is involved to sort of make that dynamic. So instead of, um, uh, again, the same principle would work. If you have the screen and the light source, and in between there will be some element that is able to, say, steer light dynamically with the video. <coughs> So you would have like a moving pictures and also so it could refocus differently, maybe pr produce some holographic uh, projections uh, at some viewing angles, things like this. So even staying within this uh, sort of personal devices uh, paradigm, we, st we already see that uh, the need for tunable optics might be pretty, pretty high. Uh, finally, staying with this sort of uh, the the concept of Apple products, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, of course, the the leader technology, the light detection and ranging, is now exploding technologically. All the self-driving capabilities of, of the vehicles need to be supported by this kind of uh, leader systems that just essentially sends out the light and detects it back and you need to do that in three-dimensional space so that the, the vehicle or any other uh, object can map the three-dimensional uh, surrounding and again the necessity of having the beam steering the necessity of having the tunable elements that can dynamically change how you send out the light how you focus light how you process the light back again we see directly that there is a need for dynamical optical elements and while right now it is made uh, sort of on the mechanical basis, you have some <coughs> rotating, uh, like the whole scanning is basically done mechanically. Wouldn't it be nice to have a single piece of glass with some layer which is barely 100 nanometers thin, 
with some functional antennas that could be changed in real time and thus the function of that surface would be changed and, and hopefully everything could be integrated in, in a smart way into the cameras or the glasses or maybe in the leader system. So this is our starting thought. We should have something dynamically tunable that works hopefully in the visible, in the optical range. So it works with the light that we can see. We see the light from about 450 nanometers up to 7, 80 nanometers. In that range, I just here try to list some of the examples of how the tunable capability can enter. I do not say that this is the, the complete list or uh, there are many more groups working on that. I just try to out of my out of my head to, to list whatever functionalities, for example, would be allowing the, this the steerability, the reconfigurability of your optics. You can do it thermally. You can do it magnetic mechanically. You apply magnetic field. Something mechanical is moving. You're changing the, the focal distance. Things like this. You do it electromechanically, so you can. Uh, Again, apply electric current and maybe with the piezo electric effect you can change the, the distance between the elements, the way they couple, things like this. You can do all optical, so you can buy ultra short pulses, you can use uh, nonlinear effects and that would change the optical response of the system. You can do it by phase change materials, also a pretty popular uh, avenue to reach the reconfigurable optics. And phase change means you, you experience the phase transition in some material you say thermally activated and let's say it transits from the electric to metal and then of course that sort of reshuffles the entire optical response of the system it works pretty efficiently uh, so there are a number of groups working uh, with that as Joel different Southampton, the Capacitor and Harvard, the Farron uh, and Caltech, Malieu and Heidelberg, Thomas Taubner, uh, Nicholas Cotter, Hald Giesen, Stuttgart. I will and make more comment on the later later work from Hal because they actually also tried the magnetic tunability. But also, I, out of the recent literature, I've seen some examples of the tunable optics. So just for you, visually, how it works. You have a surface, let's say, with the nanoparticles made of gold. And of course, these nanoparticles, they support the so-called localized surface plasma. So the plasmas are just collective oscillations of electrons in these particles. There are a lot of free electrons in these particles. Thus, they oscillate, and they are able to couple to, to, to light. And actually, this is the, one of the reasons why uh, stained windows work, for example. So small particles of silver or gold can scatter selective wavelengths, can absorb selective wavelength, and that's why you can see these vivid colors that never fade because also the particles are embedded into the dielectric matrix of the glass that we did in the Middle Ages. So the idea is that these particles readily work with light. They're the size of um, some nanometers, maybe 50 nanometers. And the way they couple to each other also influences the way they interact with light. And in this particular <coughs> case, they are assembled at the interface of the two electrolytes. Uh, one is organic, another one is aqueous electrolyte, and applying the different uh, potentials to that interface, they either form a continuous film or they just randomly <coughs> distributed in one of the electrolytes. And the, the consequences of that is that you can actually form a dynamic mirror. So if you have something under that uh, container with the, with the solvents, that was the 10... Uh, 10 pound uh, bill. Uh, so you, they're from Imperial College. Yeah, so that's <laughs> these are pounds. Uh, so you can see it through when the window is, the window state is activated. So it's this one. When the particles are just floating around, you see a slightly reddish color. I think that is the native uh, scattering somewhere in the red. Uh, and then you can apply that potential. You essentially reverse the potential. And then you form a mirror, and then so the coin is actually positioned above that container, and instead of seeing what's on the bottom, you're seeing what's on top. So you have a dynamic capability of uh, a switching mirror. Of course, it's the liquid interface. 
I mean, technologically, it might be a little bit cumbersome to, to integrate with electronics, but this is a very, very cool example of how, in a reasonably simple means, you can actually create a tunable optical element. It's a tunable mirror. Either it's fully transparent or it is reflective. Then, of course, the example from, from here, from SDU, out here is the prominent figure in the field of uh, changing, uh, sort of writing down different colors, and then again, you dynamically change the, um, the way this resonance is interacted with light. And you can create the entire gamma of, of colors, and potentially also could be maybe dynamically uh, steered and reversible. Uh, so you can think of sort of reflective uh, screens, uh, things like this. So that is also one of the ways to, to create a dynamic surfaces that interact with the visible light. Uh, one of the uh, very recent examples is, is, is actually the work from the group where I spent my sabbatical at Stanford, Mark Bonesman. And in this case, it's actually not even plasmonic, so there, is, there are no metals there. So it's the silicon nanowires positioned on, in front of the aluminum mirror. And just by tuning into different resonances, there are different kind of resonances, electrical, magnetic, at the different heights. So they build, uh, Aaron is the first author of that paper, he built this um, MEMS uh, sort of frame that is able, by applying magnetic field, it actually slightly bends. So essentially your wire is walking up and down well, the, the spacing there is like half a micron to the mirror, and then it moves, let's say, 100 nanometers by applying different voltages, but that amazingly changes the color of that wire. So you already have electrically tunable color of the scatterer of the visible light. Uh, it, it is not extremely fast, so you can probably do it best in megahertz, uh, because then it enters into the resonance of the entire frame. So it's a little bit slow, but it's extremely functional. I mean, it's the, the visible change is, uh, is amazing. You go from red to green, so you span the entire visible range. So these are some examples of how people tried in that field come to the tunable uh, optical elements of different kinds. Of course, these are very simple functionalities, changing the color, changing the scattering, changing the transparency, but that's the first step. So I promised to talk more about how Gissens work. And what they do, they actually combine plasmonic antennas that are gold antennas with the um, magneto-optical films. So then uh, I'll show you later how that potentially works. But, but even the simple combination of the, this kind of structures sitting on top of the magnetic film, which by itself could be magnetized, kind of creates already the, uh, the functionality that we're looking at for. It's the functionality of changing, say, the, poli the circular polarization of outcoming light. So let's see how that would potentially work. Luckily for us, the essence of this uh, combination of ferromagnetic elements or films and uh, uh, plasmonic gold uh, nanostructures, nanoantennas, was kind of figured by Michael Faraday already 150 years ago. Even though he didn't combine them, he just discovered both fields separately. So first he discovered the magneto-optics. Magneto-optics is about applying magnetic field to some material, uh, transparent material, how it's pictured here in the, his original figure. <clears throat> it's the action of magnets on light. So you send in the light beam through that material and then you apply a magnetic field to it and it turns out that the polarization of the light that you send in starts to rotate or start to become elliptical. So you remove the magnetic field, it becomes linear again as the original um, the incoming polarization of light. And that is the magneto-optical <coughs> effect which is called the Faraday effect in transmittance and is also called the Kerr effect in the reflectance. Uh, so material needs to be magnetic and material needs to be well reasonably transparent to reach that functionality. Well at the same time Michael Faraday was experimenting with the gold particles. I don't think he knew exactly that they were 
gold nanoparticles. There was no way to, to see them, but it's pretty amazing that uh, the vial that he fabricated, so this red color, comes exactly from those localized resonances in the gold nanostructures that we've seen uh, previously uh, in the examples of this tunable optics. So he made those solutions of the gold particles, and this is exactly how your uh, your stained window would work. But this solution stays exactly the same through the years, and the thing is that you cannot really open that because you would destroy the possibly you would destroy the chemical composition of that solution, and so there is no real way to know what is the structure of these particles that he made by, by some sort of chemical synthesis, I guess, some sort of uh, I'm not sure how he actually fabricated them, but the colors have not faded for over 150 years while staying in solution. They're, so not, they're not even embedded into any glass like your stained window would work. So he knew some secret there in plasmonics. He didn't know that it's plasmonics, but <laughs> still yeah, it's quite a visual uh, observation that gold does not look goldish anymore once you chop it into small pieces. That's looking at that. So you can still go somewhere and see this part? I think, yeah, I think it's in uh, somewhere in, in London, somewhere in the... I don't know, yeah, yeah it's because that, that's a real photo. photograph. Yeah, I should probably figure where... <laughs> we have these items in plasmonics that everyone needs to see. There is a, a cup that, that the Romans made based on this uh, the nanoparticles that scatter and reflect different colors. So then you look at it uh, with the light on the background, you see one color and you look at it in uh, reflectance and just with the ambient light it's a different color, so it's green and red. And people in Plasmonics tend to go, to, it's in the British Museums, so people in Plasmonics <coughs> tend to go and at least take a picture there, it's a very small cup. So I think we should start a new tradition of people in Plasmonics going to uh, <laughs> find this bottle of uh, Michael Faraday. Anyway, uh, this is essentially how the magnetic optics works. If you have a magnetic structure and you apply a magnetic field, and you can apply it in different ways. It's just one chosen configuration. It's called the longitudinal magnetic optical care effect. So care, I mentioned, it's the inner reflectance. Faraday would be in the transmittance. And you have a, a regional polarization of light that hits that. Uh, <clears throat> it could be either a film or it could be nanostructures. So we like nanostructures, we started making nanostructures out of the ferromagnets, but essentially people also work with films, uh, and uh, once you send in the light and you reflect that light, uh, the per original polarization would slightly, um, uh, would slightly tilt from the, the uh, incoming polarization, and that difference would actually signal how much the material is magnetized. And uh, essentially, that's how the care and fire the effects were used throughout the years, is to measure how the material is magnetized. If you apply the magnetic field, it's actually really nice to know how it is magnetized. And you can do that by magnetometry, but you can do it also optically. And it's sort of a non-destructive method because you just send in the light and you measure the reflected light and then you know how your nice structure is uh, magnetized. This, of course, is relevant for magnetic storage technology and a lot of different technological applications. So this method was used throughout the years just to characterize the magnetic materials. Uh, the reason for why is that actually doing that, why does it rotate the polarization, is just that if you have a material which the electric function looks something like that, so it actually has the non-zero non-diagonal elements. So the plasma resonances would exist here at the diagonal elements. Changing them would change that color, all these plasmonic effects. But so here enters the magnetic field. So you're actually working not with the diagonal elements of your dielectric function, but rather with the non-diagonal elements. And here, depending on how you apply that magnetic field, x, y, z, you activate different elements, and you would bend light in different way, or you make it more or less elliptical, so it, then it's up to you to choose which configuration you're measuring in. Uh, it's basically, well, it's sort of a technicality. How do you want to probe your <coughs> magnetization? <coughs> the thing is that, of course, 
You could uh, do nanostructures out of uh, these ferromagnets. That's what we are doing. And when you measure something like that, you can ramp your magnetic field. So how do you measure the, how the material is magnetized? You want to measure that respond, response at each applied magnetic field and see when it saturates so it's fully magnetized no matter how more you apply a magnetic field it doesn't get more magnetized because all the spins are aligned, all the domains are aligned. This is what you can extract from this kind of uh, hysteresis curves. So you start with a zero magnetic field, you start applying it, let's say in this configuration and then you just interpret the, uh, the polarization rotation of your light or the ellipticity of your light in terms of the smoke intensity. You, in principle, you could also just normalize it to the saturation values. Important is how the loop looks like and where it saturates. So you see that you start magnetizing your material, it goes up, and at a certain point it will stay magnetized no matter how strong field you're applying. And this is the field that you're applying, 500 Ersted, and I promised uh, the fridge magnet. So actually the fridge magnets that you have, possibly in your kitchen, are about 100 Ersted, so it's 10 milli Tesla if you want to convert that. This is potency. So if you imagine that 100 is somewhere here, for certain structures you are pretty much at the fridge magnet limit. So this is, it's a really low magnetic field. I mean, of course, these days you have this enormously strong um, magnets, They're even sort of um, the static magnets that you can use in your household can be pretty strong, but these are not necessarily those, so this is just the typical low fields that you get from uh, the standard alloys that are on the market. So you don't need much magnetic field. If your structures are supposed to magnetize, so they kind of like to magnetize with the low magnetic field and all the domains are aligned, you don't need to apply a high magnetic field. But then back to the interpretation of that loop, is that you can actually see quite a lot of features just measuring that the rotation of polarization. For example, for these disks, you actually see the narrowing here in the middle, and that signals that your magnetization from originally in plane starts to curl upwards and form this like a vortex state. And at some point, it gets stabilized, but then it decays. You continue applying magnetic field, and it kind of goes into your in plane position, so that narrowing actually signals that. Or here you would see that applying magnetic field along the different axis, I mentioned the easy axis, like where the material likes to be magnetized. It turns out that if you have the anisotropic structure like the ellipse, you apply the magnetic field along the long axis and you see that it actually keeps the magnetization even if you completely remove the field. This is how the magnetic memory works. You magnetize something, you need to remove that magnet, and the information stays there. So that is the nice way to store your information when you magnetize something along the so-called easy magnetization axis. Whereas in the short axis, there is no width of that loop. So you actually do not maintain the written information. Uh, and so you see actually here for the disks, you reach the saturation at much higher magnetic fields, but just because you a little bit helped the magnetic field with the shape of your nanostructures, you can saturate them at much lower fields, and, well, potentially that is good for your magnetic memory. This is a short uh, intro into how magnet optics <laughs> really serves the humanity to measure the magnetization of your structures and eventually the function of your hard drive. Sorry, I I have a very naive question here. Sure. I was all the way uh, through thinking about how could you manipulate your uh, diagonal elements here. Hmm? How can you manipulate them? Uh, it would be interesting. And uh, of course you do it by the magnetic field. But it seems by what you say here, it's either not or fully saturated. So if you, do you, would you have any interest in sort of a scaling the uh, saturation point? Can you do that? Uh, is that, like I said, it's a naive question, probably stupid. Yeah, no, 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 there are no such thing as stupid questions. We will know that. Uh, if you mean the level of the rotation yes. that you produce, of course that depends on the material, it depends on the structure, because here you see it's one. That's just 
It's a normalization. Uh, it's a normalization, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that actually happens at different. So you can actually rotate the original polarization of light more or less depending on the uh -huh. material yeah, yeah, yeah. that you use and depending on the structure. And actually, I will show you okay. later how we can play with that. Uh, so surely, I mean, all these intermediate points exist. This is real polarization rotation with the applied magnetic field. But certainly, you would like to stay to be somewhere here because that's a static situation. So you, nothing is changing anymore. A slight variation of the magnetic field here will produce quite a substantial change in the polarization rotation. Like if you're sitting here, you know, a slight couple of earth stats would create a big difference and you don't want that for your functional system. But since I mentioned uh, the nanostructures and since I mentioned that we like them so much, I can uh, briefly tell you how we make them. So it so happens that back in Gothenburg, where I work, we have a tradition of developing bottom-up nanofabrication methods. And bottom-up means we let the nature do the job by itself. And so when we fabricate something, we just allow the structures to assemble in a particular pattern that is governed by um, electrostatic forces, interaction with the substrate, so the, the different parameters that enter that. And then we use that as a mask uh, to, to, to create all sorts of nanostructures. So what you see here are gold nanodisks. And of course, we do not deposit gold nanodisks on the substrate. We use uh, colloidal particles. And then with this series of processes, if you're interested, you can look at the details here. The paper been published 10 years ago. <coughs> Uh, and it's quite a detail the recipe is giving there in, uh, in how you can produce various types of structures. So the thing with that is that you can actually produce centimeter square substrates in a matter of hour maybe, different uh, configurations of your uh, nanostructures of different materials. So it's a really easy and cheap method of either making directly your functional nanostructures or just testing things. Uh, you, essentially, you don't even need a clean room for that because it's really like a wet bench process. You have aqueous solutions of the colloidal particles, and you need some instruments, yeah, to deposit metals, of course, like or also to spin coat the resist, things like this. But there's nothing compared to e lithography or all this top-down fabrication where you really need an expensive environment and instruments. And it seems like that method had been picked up in several groups uh, throughout the world and uh, the different structures that could be made. I mean, the library is pretty extensive. You can make dimers, quadrimers, the different uh, antenna, different sized antennas. You can make split wind resonators. This is a work from Harold Giesen. This is a work from Naomi Hallis group in the RICE. This is our own work where we actually uh, made the contacts for spin torque oscillators. So there is nothing even connected to sort of light and nano. This is a purely nanofabrication exploration of how the method, uh, how this method could be applied to make a functional spintronic devices. So if you're interested in further details, again, look at this original paper. It's well described there. And uh, it's not only to make nanostructures on a given substrate, you can also pattern your substrate with the features that you want to achieve. Uh, these are the examples of patterning uh, polycrystalline silicon or crystalline silicon with the extra arrays of little uh, holes in this case. And of course, you add sort of a light management capability here. So you add like a photonic management to your solar cell. If your original surface is flat, you add these holes, they capture light better, you eventually uh, increase the efficiency of the solar cell. In this case, that is the, the polycrystalline silicon solar cell. Here we actually enhanced quite a lot the efficiency here. The problem was that it's really hard to then um, put the top electrode in that structure because it becomes really, really porous. Uh, but uh, the functional uh, solar cell that is actually only effectively 600 nanometers thick with the 
efficiency of 8.6 that is independently confirmed or I think the, the largest was 9 point something. So you actually have a semi-transparent crystalline solar <coughs> cells and just because we pattern them with this little hole so on top it looks something like that. And we etch the solar cell. This is the thickness of the original solar cell. We essentially remove 50% of that material and yet it is a reasonably high efficiency cell, so I mean, typically you would have 200 microns and you would have an efficiency of 22% you know, or something. So here with the sub-micron effective thickness we are losing the efficiency only twice. Let's say. But this is just to demonstrate that the method could be used in completely different contexts if you are thinking of applying it to your own research. Uh, it's also that we were thinking that, of course, when you make structures, you would like to transfer them sometimes. Some substrates are not suitable to be patterned. Substrates like plastics, you cannot etch them. Substrates like uh, money <laughs> bills are pretty fragile. So, uh, and if you want to add the extra nano functionality to these surfaces, we for you, we developed the special methods how to transfer the structures that originally you would make on, let's say, silicon wafer, well-controlled conditions. It doesn't have to be actually this bottom-up structures. It could be anything. It could be e-beam pattern that you want to put on this desk. Just transfer that. So we have something for you. It's a simple uh, procedure that is, again, described in detail in this paper. You essentially, you use the... Uh, the sacrificial layer and you lift your structure and then you deposit it and then you remove the, the, the carrying uh, film and here you go, you can basically pattern uh, PDMS uh, fluidics, you can pattern glass of course, you can pattern, this is the, the transmission electron microscope grids where the supporting film which is carbon just carries your structures and you can do analysis at single uh, with the atomic resolution you can wrap stuff with these uh, carpets of nanostructures. Here they are actually supported by the film that is not visible in the electron microscope, but they, you see they are kind of, the carpet wraps the bigger spheres. The bigger spheres are polystyrene and two microns. So it's pretty flexible um, approach that you could use. Again, you can deposit your structure. You see the pink color. So the pink color is the color of plasmonics. We've learned that in the first mirror, we've seen that in color printing. Uh, so these are the colors that are created by these gold nanostructures. And you can see that you can actually deposit them on pretty fragile objects and in pretty porous objects. And also you can deposit them on pretty low quality and cheap objects like a plastic of your uh, commercial LED. And then you can even project whatever you deposited onto the wall here. No Photoshop, that's just the picture. <laughs> and you see it's the logo of of Schaumers University of Technology. It is projected from the size of you know, like 50 microns here into the wall into five centimeters. So actually, that, that is of course written with e-beam lithography, but the pattern survives, could be transferred to really nasty substrates, really rough substrates, and it can even function like a projection mask. So now back to, now we know how to make these things. Um, Let's see what can we do combining magnetism and uh, plasmonics. So essentially, you want your um, uh, magnetic structure be simultaneously plasmonic structure. That's the um, <coughs> that's the key idea of uh, of the rest of the presentation. Uh, of course, uh, these localized plasmons can also come in the flavor of the propagating plasmons. So you have a film where these collective oscillations actually propagate along the interface. There is a lot of work done on that here at SDU. If you're interested, please uh, talk to Sergei Bozhevolny and Asger. Uh, but the concept of combining magnetism and plasmonics works surprisingly similar for these two types of, um, of uh, electronic oscillations, you essentially want to change, for the propagating plasmas, you essentially change the, the k vector of that plasma. For um, the localized plasma, you really change how the, um, how the near field uh, looks like. The near field is something 
how the electromagnetic field gets confined to the nanoscale from the original field of light that lands on these antennas. There are several examples of how people combine that over the years. You can, for example, change the transparency of this kind of array where there are holes. So here is gold and here is the magnetoptic electric film. So when you measure the transparency and you apply magnetic field, the transparency is actually changing depending on which field you're applying here in millitesla. You already learned fridge magnet, 10 millitesla, good scaling, here 40. <coughs> so again, applying moderately quite low magnetic fields, you can play with the transmittance in this kind of arrays. You can, uh, similar to this example, you can actually change how the propagating plasmons react when you have a little uh, fraction of your ferromagnet in the film. Or you can have this kind of crystals where there is this plasmonic antennas spaced equally and then actually you can uh, increase the magnet optical effect of the underlying film. So in localized case, I will focus on uh, the localized plasmons, the simple and visual um, example. It's where you have these disks that you've seen before. And now they're made of ferromagnet, this is nickel. And then you see that you actually have these resonances in the visible range that are look like dipoles. So they actually support uh, these localized surface plasmas. Localized surface plasmas, these are essentially dipolar oscillations in this case. You, you can look at the phase of this uh, oscillation. So they look just like plasmas in your gold nanostructures, except that now this is a ferromagnet. <coughs> and the consequences of that it's a ferromagnet, of course, we can make these uh, loops as you've seen before. We can apply a magnetic field, we can measure the polarization rotation, except that now the polarization rotation looks really different depending on whether you're sitting to the left or to the right of your plasma resonance. So you have this extra parameter all of a sudden in the system, this plasmonic response of your antenna. It's not just ferromagnetic anymore. You have this extra uh, thing in your system that actually makes the magneto-optical response totally unpredictable from, <laughs> from first sight. So you can actually change that on the fly. Uh, the thing is that what we were doing also, we, you can measure that in uh, spectrally. So you can collect these loops at every single wavelength. So this dot, the height of that data point, is actually the difference between this saturation point and this saturation point, except that here they are normalized. But like I mentioned, they actually have a different height, all these loops have different height, means the, the rotation of polarization is different in all the systems and that is actually expressed here, so k rotation is different in different wavelengths. It's interesting that when we mess up uh, the system here is that when we add a little bit of um, the refractive index, the difference uh, to our plasmonic uh, antennas, and plasmonics actually is known to be sensitive to the surrounding index. This is how plasma sensors are working. You add the molecules and then your resonance feels the presence of that molecule just by the fact that the refractive index is changed around that plasma resonance. So here, uh, exactly that's what we're doing. We're changing the refractive index and the whole thing is actually moving to the red. Um, the actual uh, consequence of that, uh, if you're interested in plasmonic sensing, of course you can look around in the literature. I think there's uh, also activity here uh, on that subject, some recent report, uh, recent review, or you can look at the book that we happen to uh, gather together. But the thing is that when you start adding ferromagnets to this sensing, you all of a sudden, again, you have an extra parameter. It's not just the, the optical resonance, the peak of your plasma, but it's also this uh, magneto-optically induced phase shift in your antennas and I, I, I changed my mind, I don't want to go into details here, but essentially well you would be looking at this moving of that point that crosses zero of the magneto-optical response just as in this example here, you would, you would be just tracking one point here so you know that magneto-optics goes to zero and it's at some point it happens in many materials and uh, just because there are also plasmons in these antennas, the point will be moving. And by looking at how much it moves, you can actually um, build a sensor based on 
measuring magnet optical activity in your nanometer. Uh, that's the essence of that work. Uh, here, I would say like that. Of course, you can combine these antennas in different configurations. Here, we are working with the dimer. The funny part that you can actually sense the distance between these two particles in a dimer, just as a single antenna would sense the change in the dielectric environment of that antenna. When you have two antennas, they would sense each other. And uh, the distance between them is, a, is an important information that you would like to, to track, for example, in the systems where you actually want to measure distances at this scale, 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers. And all you need to do is just to expose them to magnetic field and measure the reflected or transmitted light from that system. And you would track the polarization rotation in this case, and for every 10, 20, 30, 40 nanometers uh, in that sensor, you would have a completely different polarization rotation. But this is how you know that, okay, in my system, let's say it's the mass of some molecules, of some uh, proteins, whatever, you would actually get the direct information of how different parts are spaced from each other just because you have this dimer attached somewhere to your, um, to your functional uh, units and just by applying the magnetic field and measuring that polarization rotation from the outside you would directly measure the distances with pretty high accuracy so we were just making a formal comparison with what if this would be just made of gold and it turns out the, the quality of measurement with the magnetic system is about two orders of magnitude better than compared to gold system I guess that's all you would need to know. Here is actually the the real example how these loops look like when we don't normalize them one to another. So you see there are all sorts of different uh, polarization rotations available in the system. These are again, this is just a simple um, nano ellipsis. And you can see that depending on how you come with your original polarization of light, here green or red, green or red or something in between, this is just a disk, so there are no <coughs> axes. You form completely different uh, amount of polarization rotation. So I mean, this is like a cheap way of creating the tunable optical system. You just apply magnetic field to a ferromagnetic antenna, and you actually get a different polarization rotation as the outcome. So that's your tunable, real-time tunable system. Um, sort of given by the nature of uh, A, uh, magnetic optics of course get enhanced because there are also plasmons in these antennas, but it's simply because magnetic optics is there. So you naturally get the sort of magnetically tunable antennas. I think I will not uh, skip that, you can formalize it in, in the math. Um, it's just uh, one highlight here is that, of course, you can play with the geometry. You don't have to stick to a flat ellipsis. You can play with the different uh, configurations of your axis. And, of course, you would influence your plasma resonances in these antennas. And, as a result, you would influence your magneto-optical care response. Let's say here there's a dramatic change just because we change different configurations of this antenna. Staying basically on the same amount of material is just that the way we come with light, the way we um, configure this antenna creates a complete different set of polarization rotations that come up. But of course, this is like a cheap way of making a tunable uh, surface uh, because we are not using anything else than just the intrinsic magnet optical activity of this uh, that happen to be plasmonic antennas. There is a bit of a more smarter way to, to do that. Now we want to combine the gold, which is the classic plasmonic material, nice scattering antennas with ferromagnetic elements and see how that could influence whatever we can do in the near field, that is in the scale of nanometers, or in the far field, so the light that comes out. This is just a surface that is made, filled with these antennas. These are trimers. So when the trimer is made of purely gold nanodisks, uh, what we measure actually, it is symmetric. 
and what we measure is the difference between the transmission of the right and left circular polarism. Okay, in chemistry it's called circular dipolarism. Here is a little bit more complicated with the naming because, well, it, we better stick to differential transmitters, okay? And not to offend people in different uh, areas of chiral cosmonics. We, we just measure the transmission without even analyzing its polarization state. So we send in the circular polarized light, could be left or right, so your polarization is just rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. And uh, out come some photons that we just detect and we collect this spectrum. So of course this is, uh, I mean here then necessarily comes the concept of chirality <coughs> that you have the you know, right and left hand cannot be superimposed. That's the last thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the thing is that when you end adding the ferromagnetic elements, not only you, you break the symmetry, but you also get this dynamic tunability. And this is how you essentially get it. So if you look here, this is the schematics of what we're doing. There is a circular polarized light that comes in, and then we apply magnetic field to that surface. So gray here is the differential transmission from this uh, surface when there is no magnetic field. And then you start applying plus or minus magnetic field, which is in this case out of plane, and then that is the tunability that you get. You essentially can reshuffle your the response of your chiral surface, so it can be substantially more transmitting right circular polarized light or substantially less transmitting uh, right circular polarized means transmitting more left circular polarized light. You can play with the parameters of these antennas that luckily our method uh, of fabrication allows that. You can change the gaps and at the end you can map something that is the the tunability sort of how much can you can tune that system and it turns out that it, in certain configurations you can tune it up to yeah, 100, more than 100 percent. So if you're sitting somewhere here let's say your original response is somewhere here you can actually sort of change that more than 100 percent in terms of how much uh, circularly polarized the light comes out. So this is, we see it as the, uh, the starting of this adventure of tunable optics while we're not using purely ferromagnetic structures which are also actually pretty absorbing. Uh, so in this case we start going into plasmonic metals and the thing is that the whole concept also holds for high index, high refractive index dielectric structures like silicon. So in principle the same uh, ideas would apply to basically fully transparent surfaces. How can you change the response of the surface by applying a certain amount? So I would... Uh, this is not magnetically tunable yet, so I would skip that part and jump into the final slide. And of course the future, as I say, we see that system as the first step towards truly magnetically controlled <coughs> optics. But also, why not to think of the chemistry? You know, when you have these things and you have a near field, and if you have photoactive molecules that probably transform under the influence of that field, wouldn't you be able to control the, the transformation of the photo transformation of the molecules just by applying externally magnetic field? So you'd have like a chemist, magnetically controlled chemistry at the nanoscale. Then. Uh, what we are trying to explore is the functionalities on the unexpected uh, surfaces, such as these. And this is open. I mean, we create the method. It's open to everyone, for everyone to use. And I'm ha I'm happy to to assist. And I didn't mention this uh, the solar thing, but then again, what if we can create the antennas that absorb the solar light and the amount they absorb? is tuned by the applied magnetic field. So it's sort of like magnetically controlled solar cells, magnetically controlled solar surfaces. But that's what's coming next. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Questions? I have first one.
one question, maybe you mentioned it at some point. What's kind of the time scale for dynamic processes here? So when you say, yeah. for your technical example, I guess your iPhone should do this in yes. realistic time, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, magnetic field is, of course, not extremely fast. Mm -hmm. And the fastest you can get, I think the commercial sources reach about <coughs> 10 gigahertz. Okay. But it's changing up and down. That is, pre that is pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, that's already technologically fast enough to, I mean, it's beyond the video and all that. So it's like you can actually process the information. So you, you can, can go kind of choose this to be this curve, I guess. I mean, I, I mean yeah. gigahertz time scale. The gigahertz time scale, yeah. Oh. So, I mean, there are, right now, there are sources of, I think, 10 gigahertz, or even 20 gigahertz. You know, I mentioned this uh, tunable uh, silicon antennas and all these, of course, thermal processes, that is really slow, yes. unfortunately. So all these transformations would happen, yeah, I don't know, kilohertz or megahertz at best. I mean, it's fundamentally limited. Here we are in a little bit better situation. Does uh, heating, is that a problem for you? Because, I mean, usually when you heat up, like, magnetics gets worse and plasmonic antennas, they, they do heat up, right? I mean... They do heat up, yes. Uh, so we... We do not use high intensity light sources, okay. and uh, we actually, they do indeed heat, and uh, the fact is that we <laughs> actually explore that for the solar thing, that they tend to absorb a very broad um, spectrum of light. So if you look, if you remember those resonances, they're pretty broad. So gold would be really sharp and it's absorbing it. 500, nice color, whereas nickel and all these ferromagnets, they're fairly broad. So uh, they're not that efficient absorbers, actually, at the given wavelength. So, but certainly, yes, and of course, magnetic properties decay with increased temperature. And yeah, we, uh, we faced several of these uh, difficulties when we combine, let's say, noble metal antennas that heat up ex extremely well, and then you have some ferromagnetic elements and that is just completely baked when you just shine in a laser light because the plasmas are so efficient in capturing light and uh, transforming yeah. them into heat. It could be an issue, yes. When you transfer your structures, yes. is it with a substrate or without a substrate? Uh, For example, this picture you show with yeah. the arrow there. Yes. So, uh, I mentioned that briefly, so the, the supporting uh, thing that makes them float is the carbon film. It's amorphous yeah. carbon of 10 nanometers. Yeah. So you make your stuff on the amorphous carbon film, and under that carbon there is some area that could be removed by, let's say, etching. Yes. So that's, thus they start floating, but then the carbon film, of course, is easily removed by a really brief uh, oxygen plasma edge. Right, yeah. So it's enough to ash it like for five seconds, and the carbon, the supporting carbon film is completely gone, even under the structure. So your structures land on your target substrate, because these guys are not supported by any carbon. These are the pristine uh, gold nanodisks that are sitting on the, on the light bulb. Okay. Or, uh, on, on the, on the yeah. Last question. Uh, um, I was thinking when you showed uh, how the, um, these electro-optical effects changes with wavelength yes. going across the, the, the plasma resonance. Yes. I mean, what, what would, given that even the, the sign of these electro-optical effects changes, it goes to the right at a certain point, while at, at another wavelength it goes out towards the left. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would happen if you have like a laser with the bandwidth as large as the resonance? and you see at the reflected light of the laser. Because part of the wavelengths inside the laser would rotate left, and <coughs> another part of the laser would rotate right. Uh, yeah, actually, the funny part that, in principle, magnetic optics is used to isolate your laser cavities. Yeah. Because when you apply a magnetic field, the system becomes non-reciprocal. So imagine you have a, a thick bulk of transparent mid optical yeah, material. It's the Faraday rotator principle. Exactly, yeah. So you actually shine in the linear light, it rotates 45, but when it comes back, it rotates further 45 because it's non reciprocal. So if you have a cross polarized scheme, that light can never come back. Mm -hmm. So it actually is used in, in, the, in the lasers. But of course, in this case, uh, um, the magnet optical response needs to be as flat 
as possible throughout the operation range, mm -hmm. I would say, because of course we we're twisting things. We're adding plasmons. It starts to be extremely wavelength dependent. But I mean, the nickel film, let's say, it is sort of uh, reasonably flat as a material, as a magnetic optical material. Yeah, but like in that case, it seems like it, you can create like a an energy vortex. I mean, a, a, a vortex which is energy result at different energies, you have different polarization, and you, and you have a point. If you can degree. have a sharp gradient in how the magnetic optical response uh, looks like spectrally, yeah. surely, yeah. If you have a, a sort of spectrally separated, five nanometers spectrally separated uh, lines that one would, you know, rotate 45 to the left and one would rotate 45 to, to the right. Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly. But it's actually quite hard to, to make those sharp gradients in the middle of the distance. Most of the materials have really flat, uh, at least indivisible, really flat uh, rotation. Or in, in the interest of time, I suggest that we continue discussions offline. And, uh, so let's uh, thank Sasha. Yeah.